This conference will now be recorded. Okay, would you like me to read the declaration? Yes, please. Due to the nature of the declaration of a state of emergency due to novel coronavirus COVID-19 pursuant to code section 2.2-3708.2, this meeting is to be held by electronic communications via the web platform GoToMeeting. The catastrophic nature of this declared emergency makes it impractical and unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location, and the purpose of this meeting is to discuss or transact the business statutorily required or necessary to continue operations of the public body. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the uh, call call the meeting to order. Stacey, will you conduct roll call, please? Yes, from the city of Fredericksburg, Dave McLaughlin. Here. Joshua Brock. Present. John Castellarin. Matthew Rowe. From Spotsylvania County, Al Durante. Present. Neil Holleran. From Caroline County, Ken Pogue. Michael Hoyt. Justin Chenault. From Stafford County, Melvin Allen. Dave Swan. Present. Ethelene Crenshaw. Glenn Goldsmith. Wade Sudreth. Here. Tara Durant. From King George County, Robert Gates. At large members, Larry Gross. Here. Rupert Farley. Here. And Dustin Savage. Okay, we have low attendance tonight, Mr. Chair, but I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um... And we'll move to the approval of the agenda for this meeting. Uh, before we do that, does anyone have any changes that need to be made to the agenda as published? I move approval of the agenda. Thank you. Can I have Dave a second? Swan, second. Dave okay. Swan, second. Thanks, Dave. Uh, all in favor of the uh, agenda as published? Oh, aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Thank you. The agenda is approved. Uh, now we move to the approval of the CTAC meeting minutes. Um, are there is there any discussion about the meeting minutes from our last meeting on May 12th? Move approval of the minutes. Thank you. Dave Swan seconds. Thank you. Uh, is there any anyone uh, who would need to abstain from this vote because they did not participate in the meeting or or look at it uh, uh, as the videotape of it? Okay, hearing no abstentions, everyone in favor of the meeting minutes as published, vote aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, thank you. And we'll move on to old business. Um, we talked we talked last time about our advisory role, how important it is. Um, and we talked about the Fred Transit experience. And uh, Stacy helped me out. There was a there was a uh, which I did not do obviously because I would know <laughs> it. Um, there was a uh, some training that we could have had 
it was uh, in the last meeting. Probably, yeah, yeah, and you know. I will, if no one has taken advantage of the Fred Travel Training with Tamara Banks, um, it's a free um, Fred experience. Um, Ian has taken it, I've taken it, Matthew's taken it, Jordan's taken it. Um, I believe Kate on the line from um, GWRC might have also taken it. It's a great experience. Um, Tamara takes you along the route. You get to pick the route, um, and you'll just be able to experience what it's like to ride Fred if you never have. If you have ridden Fred before, Tamara's really great about pointing out things that might be challenging to certain passengers um, or areas where Fred could improve their service. Um, she also helps you learn how to use the app to ride and can talk to you about um, all kinds of things that you might have never known about riding public transit, Fred specifically. Um, so go ahead and I'll send the email around again, but it had um, contact information for you to reach out to Tamara and set a time up. Um, she's really eager to get at least a few SeaTac members to take her up on her offer. Um, and that's basically what we were going to talk about. But is there anyone, I guess, who has has done the travel training with Tamara or just rode on your own and want to share anything? OK, uh, so the good news is uh, the buses are fully air conditioned, so that will be comfortable to ride around. Uh, over the next two months, and we have two months to do this now because uh, we're not going to have a meeting next month so uh please put that uh on your to-do list um it's it's on my to-do list as well uh, any more discussion on uh on that stacy is that um is that training open to any any resident or yes Yes. Okay. So originally, um, Tamara doesn't work for Fred Transit. She works for Healthy Generations, also known as the Rab Hannock Area Agency on Aging. Originally, their grant only allowed for certain populations, so those with disabilities, older residents, but now anyone, it's open to anyone at all. Okay. Thank so you. you can take a friend. You don't have to go yeah. by yourself. Make a date of it. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I'm looking something here. Uh, stand by just one second. Um, if I can find this quickly enough. Oh, here it is. I've got a point of order, Mr. Chairman. Go my, ahead. Uh, my screen is a look, got the uh, image zoomed in so much that I can only see. A fraction of the uh, page of the agenda. Is there anybody else having that problem? Uh, yeah, I also have that problem. I can't zoom in and out like I normally could. It's getting better. Is that better? Okay. Better as long as. As long as I zoom out to 50%, I can see most of it. Yeah. Normally, at 100%, at I can see the whole page. Yes, same here. Um, Jordan, just know that, like, I don't know what you can see, but right now we can see five is at the top, item five, and then we can see F, but we can't see anything else. So just if you could just keep that in mind as you're moving it up and down. So yeah. I can see it perfectly on my side um, and I'm I'm at home, not at the office. Um, so <laughs> I'm not sure if it's everybody's having the problem. Larry, just FYI, we can't see you either. We just see a blur on your screen. I'm not sure if your camera's covered or if you perhaps zoomed in on your side, I don't know, but yeah, anyway. I, I cover my camera. But I can see on the agenda, I can see all the way down to F. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, this is Josh. I had that tr trouble too. Uh, I found that if I used my scroll on my mouse, 
uh, hovering over the wind that that part of the window itself, it fixed it. So it may be where your mouse is pointed. Yeah, and I'm able to drag as well up and down. So that's, that's helpful. All right. So yeah. Anyway, Jordan, as you're presenting, just keep that in mind that uh, we get focused on the on the subject at hand. Uh, whatever the uh, the active agenda item is. So. Speaking of which, then we'll move to the review of the policy committee meeting, Stacey. Okay. Um, the policy committee met last on May 20th, and I'll give you a couple of the highlights. There was a public hearing during that meeting for several items. There was an uh, amendment to the Transportation Improvement Program. That's um, a document that lists the near-term projects that will receive federal funding. Also an amendment to the long range transportation plan. That's the document that programs 40 years out um, with transportation projects. Also there's public hearing for the community engagement and equity plan, which you all had a briefing on at your last meeting. And also the staff's unified planning work program that serves as the staff's program uh, or work plan for the next coming fiscal year. Um, during the public hearing, there were two comments um, received and staff read those. One comment expressed report, support for an amendment to the Transportation Improvement Program, which would add the Rappahannock Area Community Services Board, so RACSB, um, paratransit project. The second comment read expressed support for an amendment to the Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, specifically, it expressed support that there would be an addition of projects that would improve and widen Lafayette Boulevard and Tidewater Trail. Um, and there were no comments received on the Community Engagement and Equity P Plan at the public hearing, and there were no comments received on the Staff Unified Planning Work Program at the public hearing. Um, next thing to bring to your attention, VDOT gave a presentation at that meeting on the upcoming changes on I-95. They are gonna install variable speed limits um, signs. So the speed will be changing in certain sections based on traffic flow and data. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to the policies webpage on our website and you can watch the recording of that presentation. Um, but in summary, VDOT presented information um, that they're going to install the vari variable speed limit technology signs along I-95 northbound, northbound only, between mileposts 115 and 130. And that work is expected to be completed in the fall of this year. And VDOT will be conducting public outreach and working with law enforcement to make sure um, that everyone is aware of this new technology. We're not familiar with this in our area. So they plan to really do some robust outreach for this. Um, they stated that these variable speed limits are used in many other states and the purpose of them is to keep traffic flowing during congested times and to improve safety. Um, next item, um, the policy committee decided to send a letter to the Secretary of Transportation um, to um, express the importance of I-95 improvements, um, specifically the improvements that would add an extra lane between exits 130 and 126. Um, these improvements were identified as um, needed in an I-95 corridor study a couple years ago. Um, and these projects are on the state's recommended capital improvement project list. However, that list has not yet been approved, so it hasn't been voted on. So this letter is just letting them know that this is a very important issue to the FAMPO region. And there were two funding items that the committee took action on. They approved um, highway infrastructure program funding, um, which allowed $125,000 to be used for phase two of the FAMPO East-West Mobility Study. Ian had touched on that at previous CTAC meetings. And then um, moving $515,000 approximately um, to a line item for regionally significant projects so that we can allocate those in the future. Um, I won't go into more detail, it's kind of complicated for me. Um, 
also the other funding item was the committee approved um, fiscal year 22 and 27 funding allocations for CMAC and STBG, so that's a certain type of federal funding. Um, is this the last one? Nope, second to last one. Um, there also was a discussion and a request for action. Um, GW Ride Connects program requested funding reauthorization, and we'll hear about that more today. That's our um, first item in member discussion, so I won't go into more detail on that. Um, and then finally, they um, approved the staff's work program that I mentioned that was up for the public hearing. And finally, just one quick note, um, we found out that the MOU between FAMPO and the uh, planning body to our north, the TPB, um, as it's called, North Stafford is a part of that. And so we have a memorandum of understanding of how uh, we do certain work for that section, which is technically, legally, in the TPB's jurisdiction, but that MOU was a long time coming, finally ironed out, finally approved, so we're done with that. Um, any questions? Nope. So done just in time to then have the effects of the new census affected, so. <laughs> Could be, yep. <laughs> I, I won't say I was at the initial kickoff meeting and then I brought that issue up probably uh, three years ago now, but anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any other qu questions or comments on the policy committee? Thank you. All right. It's time for uh, public comment. Uh, Stacy, do you have any, uh, any comments that were submitted? Yes, we have one. I'll read it now. Um, this is from a resident, David Lee Gale, and he writes, my family has loved to bike most of my life, and we try to instill an interest in our children as well. I am concerned about the increasing number of cyclists who exercise on secondary roads in our counties. I feel the same desire to get out and pedal a long ride. The feeling at the finish is pure satisfaction. We taught our children never to cycle on our narrow, winding, hilly secondary roads outside of trails or subdivisions. The sight distances are sorely inadequate and the differences in vehicle speeds and weights on these roads can create extreme hazards for both rider and driver. Vigilant drivers are thus required to operate as though on a trail designed for the speed and characteristics of bicycles rather than a roadway designed for the speed and characteristics of motor vehicles. In the interest of safety, I believe it prudent to prohibit bicycles from secondary roadways with no shoulders and limited sight dis distances. This would require action by the Commonwealth, of course, and FAMPO has recommended successful solutions in the past. If a prohibition is not possible, a campaign to discourage riding secondary roadways and to remind riders and drivers of the dangers of these narrow roads would be valuable especially as we enter the perfect weather season for cycling and folks getting out of the house after a long time inside for many for trips with family and friends thank you for your efforts to meet the challenges of improved transportation in our region well i would say we should make sure that bpac has that if we can forward that to them please if it hasn't already been presented to them by the same Certainly. person thank you uh, Mr. Chair, just uh, also a thought that occurred to me when I heard that now um, is that um, VDOT is doing a study of certain key roads in our region that are difficult to cross for cyclists and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And this would be a great submission, I think, to copy to VDOT's team that are about to begin that particular study because they may be able to identify some of those areas and then uh, this person will get a response that's actually practical as well so i i would i would yes send it to be back but i would also suggest that we forward it from ctac to the uh, vdot uh, people that are doing the study it, it may just give them extra support to to find solutions makes excellent sense thank you Ian. 
All right, now I will call for anyone who has dialed into this meeting uh, or linked into this meeting. Is there anyone from the public who wants to make a statement at this time or address the uh, committee? Is there anyone from the public listening in, dialed in, who would like to make a statement to the committee at this time? Okay, if not, there will be another opportunity to do that at the end of the meeting, the post meeting, uh, or towards the end of the meeting, there'll be another opportunity for the public to comment on what we discussed during this meeting uh, at that time. And there is also a survey, the contact information here is online uh, if you'd like to make some input on uh, the conduct of our survey for, uh, excuse me, for how we address the public and welcome your feedback and in input. Thank you. Okay, I'll close the uh, public comment period. Uh, member discussion and action. The first one will be the uh, what was alluded to uh, from the policy, the follow-up from the policy committee about GWR Ride Connect lease parking space updates, uh, some changes, slight changes from what we saw uh, in the past uh, couple of years. Kate, uh, please. All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kate Gibson. I am currently the Interim Executive Director at GWRC, the George Washington Regional Commission. Um, okay. And part of my role, oh, okay. sorry. Sorry, uh, point of order here. I mean, we, we've got, now it has made it so we can't, I mean, the, the screen, the slides are too big on our screens for us to actually see all of them. And I think we're gonna have a problem following you if that's, oh, this is better, all right. Yeah. Whatever you so, did, thank you. I did go ahead and put the link to the presentation in the chat. So if you're having trouble seeing it through GoToMeeting, you might be able to pull it up through your web browser. Um, but yes, yeah, so hopefully everyone can see the slides. Um, so, so part of my role is to oversee the GWI Connect program. And um, tonight I'm going to talk about our leased parking spaces. And um, what you have in your packet tonight is a draft of the presentation that will be given to the FAMPO Policy Committee meeting on Monday night. So just really quickly, what is GW Ride Connect? We are a transportation demand management or TDM program um, operated by GWRC. We serve all of Planning District 16, so the five localities. And we've been around since the 70s. So we've been around quite a while providing services to the region. And some of you might have seen this slide before, but just a high, at a high level, what TDM is, is basically strategies and policies to reduce travel demand or redistribute demand. So that could be a lot of things, right? That's getting people out of a single occupant vehicle into an alternate mode of transportation. It's having people share rides. It's having people work from home or work on hours that would allow their commute to be um, not during peak travel time. So there's a lot of different things that fall under the realm of TDM, but I think this um, picture kind of illustrates what all of those different things might be. And it's a cost-effective alternative to increasing capacity, um, building more roads to accommodate more single occupant vehicles. Um, so this is an illustration of that, right? So this traffic jam is only 88 people. Um, so if you get those people into a commuter bus or a carpool or a van pool, um, then you've effectively you know, solved your transportation problem. And this is just the goal of GW Ride Connect. So it's to promote, plan, and establish transportation alternatives to the single occupant vehicle, AKA driving alone, um, with the goal of improving air quality, reducing congestion, and improving quality of life. So we have kind of four different programs underneath the GW Ride Connect umbrella. Um, commuter, our commuter assistance program, so you can call in and we can help you find an alternate way to get to work. Um, the van pool connections program, so we provide technical assistance to actual van pool operators. 
um, to help them start new van pools or recruit riders or, you know, um, you know, pick different routes and things like that. We also operate the Advantage Van Pool Self-Insurance Program, which provides um, insurance to van pools across the state. And then finally, and what we're going to be focusing on tonight is our commuter parking program. So that's the focus of tonight. Um, so this program began back in 2009. Um, I've kind of included the screenshot from the actual Freelance Star article from back then about why there was a need for these spaces. Basically, people were parking at Walmart and they were told that they couldn't park there anymore. They were going to be towed. Um, so we went out and we found these different locations for leased spaces. We currently lease 75 spaces throughout the region, um, most of those within Stafford and Spotsylvania counties. And then we also lease 10 spaces in Ladysmith and Caroline County. Um, and we're currently working on a partnership with Spotsylvania County to lease spaces for a Fred feeder bus in FY27. So we've got some ideas for how we could use this program down the road. Um, but just at a high level, why do we lease spaces? Um, because shared rides begin at commuter lots. So when people are getting into a van pool together in the morning, they're meeting at a commuter lot, leaving, leaving their cars there. Um, and getting into the van and going to work that way, and then they come back and pick up their cars at the end of the day. So this is a map of the locations of those lease spaces. So you can see that we're leasing spaces, which is the green dots, um, in areas where there are no VDOT commuter lots. So the VDOT commuter lots, um, you know are free anybody can park there and leave their car there and get into their van pool or whatever it may be um, so we offer the same model um, but just in those areas that aren't currently served by VDOT commuter lots and just as far as the cost so we lease spaces for one dollar per space per workday which comes out usually about $260 per space per year. Um, the cost of building, and these figures are from um, Smart Skills rounds three, one through three, um, but the different cost estimates for building leased parking spaces or building commuter parking lots um, came out to over $24,000 per space, which would be the equivalent of building or leasing, sorry, for 93 years. So it's cheaper right to lease um, it's also um, very flexible right so we can lease these spaces and then if demand changes or you know some other um, circumstance changes we can move the spaces or reduce the number of spaces or increase it so we've got some flexibility and then we don't pay any maintenance costs so VDOT estimates that they spend about $110 per space annually on parking lot maintenance um, and so our lease agreements have the maintenance cost built in um, that that's something that the owner takes care of. Okay, would you uh, preemptively comment on uh, you know what twenty four thousand dollars is not twenty four thousand dollars of a piece of asphalt it's uh, you know eight by uh, twenty feet or whatever but it's uh, the access roads the lighting the electricity utility movements and etc yes yes very good point yes so it's the whole cost of the parking you know lot but when you break that down by the number of spaces that they're constructing that was the average cost over those three rounds so great point kate uh, dave swan just a question does that include security at any of the locations um that's a great question i don't know about the vdoc commuter lots um as far as security from the lease spaces the um owners would be in charge of that, although I, I think there's some language in there that they're not liable for for damage. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a great question. I could definitely look into that. Yeah, I, I think you know if we're trying to grow this program, and I'm all for it, uh, having some type of security might, you know, if it's possible, if it's at all possible, uh, you know, the county uh, sheriff. Uh, uh, cruises the commuter lots I'm pretty sure at least they used to when I was using the commuter lots 
and also the state troopers do it as well. But I don't know if that's still in effect. Uh, they're shorthanded, and there's a lot going on. So I'm just throwing that out as a thought as you you do your brief here. Yeah, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, and I think I failed to point out that the three locations where we're leasing spots in Stafford and Spotsylvania, those are all funded through CMAC, which is Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Improvement Funding. So we have our current grant, UPC 87764, basically, and we've had that since 2009. And because we've had it since 2009, we're grandfathered into certain guidelines. So usually CMAC projects have a three-year time limitation. Um, however, these spaces, because of a very specific piece of federal code, um, have no time limitation, so we can lease them in perpetuity. Um, we've gotten guidance from federal highways that we can reduce the number of spaces at those locations and then increase them. We can never increase them above 105 spaces, which is the original number, um, but we do have some flexibility to move that number up and down um, without changing our grandfathered in status. And then, um, you know, if this program were to go, or if this particular grant were to go away and we were to start over, we would then um, be restricted to the three-year time limitation. So originally we had presented to the policy committee last month um, for them to renew this at the current funding level, which is $17,000, which is enough to lease 65 spaces. And you can kind of see the breakdown um, of where those spaces are. This is 100% um, federal and state funding. There's no local funding that goes into this. Um, and so, so that was the original budget. Uh, as Stacey mentioned, um, they asked us to bring back more information. They didn't want to move forward um, with the program as it is, and so they asked TAC to go back and take another look at it and, and make some recommendations. So here's our average utilization data. I'm showing it as prior to COVID and during COVID. Um, so prior to COVID, we had, you know, pretty good utilization. You don't want your utilization to be 100% because then you don't have any room for growth. Um, so we were probably a little bit below where we wanted to be, um, but you know, people were definitely using the spaces. Um, during COVID, not surprisingly, that has dropped off pretty significantly. We usually have about two people using the spaces at each lot, um, and we do bi-monthly um, utilization counts. So you can see what those those utilization figures were doing during those times. So looking forward, we are hoping that we're on the path to a return um, to some level of normalcy when it comes to van pooling and commuting. Um, I, you know been hearing our folks in the office answering the phone and talking to people who are now looking for how they're going to get back to their in-person job. Um, so it's definitely picking up. We're hoping that this fiscal year is really when we see that return and we've got some money in our budget to really push, um, you know, some marketing out into the community to get people back into um, sharing rides versus driving alone. Um, we also are working with the state on a new statewide ride matching app. Um, so it's pretty cool, um, but it's it's a mobile app that you can download. You can get instant matching. Um, you can find bus routes through that and all different types of things. So um, that's coming soon, and that's another big thing that we're going to be pushing this year. Um, and then finally, I mentioned earlier that we are working with Spotsylvania County on um, potentially leasing some parking spaces for a Fred feeder bus that's been funded through Smart Scale Round 4. So that's kind of on the horizon as well. So we talked about this at the TAC meeting this month, um, the Technical Advisory Committee meeting, and TAC's recommendation was to go ahead and reduce the number of spaces we're leasing by 25%. Um, so you can see if we just did a straight cut to each um, location, what that would what that would be. Um, 
In looking at the numbers though, GWI Connect also is recommending consolidating the Chatham Square and Claiborne Run spaces just at the one location. Um, those two parking lots are actually right across the street from each other. I think they were originally leased because there weren't enough spaces at one, so they had to kind of supplement it with the other. Um, but now that we're down to a lower number of spaces, we would um, recommend consolidating those so that there's more flexibility um, and that you're not you know, eight spaces might be a little bit small for two van pools potentially. So we just want to make sure that there's enough spaces for everybody. Um, so if we were to do that um, and comparing that number of spaces to pre-COVID utilization rates, we would actually be at 76% and 74% utilization for those two locations, which is pretty healthy. Um, so we think that that's a, a good number and it leaves room for growth. Um, but it would allow us to kind of get back to those pre-COVID levels. Um, so finally, this is the revised budget. So at the, the 23 spaces for Chatham Square and the 26 spaces, um, the reduced cost would be $12,789. But Kate, the total wouldn't be 65, so that's just a typo there. Oh, I'm glad you caught that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, are there any questions about that or any feedback um, prior to the policy committee meeting on Monday? Okay, Dave Swan, there were two slides, I think it was seven and eight that were duplicates. Yeah, and I think some of this is, it goes from not being highlighted to being highlighted. So when it's a PowerPoint, it's nice because you just click it and it pops up. But when it's a PDF, it looks a little funny. But I, I think that's why. So but thank oh, you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. I see where the it's bold on the second slide. I beg your pardon. Yep. No problem. We're trying to make this perfect, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> You always do things like that. You all are, you're perfect. On <laughs> Thank you. Right, so good on you. All right. Any other questions? Uh, Kate, I've got one. So this is uh, goes beyond this particular discussion, but I remember, and it's for some people who might be newer, um, GW Ride Connect. Wasn't it the most effective program in the nation or something like that? Or I remember a statistic from a couple of years ago that was briefed to us. It had a real uh, real attaboy about the GW Ride Connect, how effective it was, as I remember. It's definitely nationally recognized. We've been asked um, several times to speak at national and international conferences. Um, we have possibly the most robust van pooling program, or at least one of the top five. Um, I think it's a kind of unique model, um, but we've done really, really well with it. Um, and, you know, certainly within the state or com just comparing us to our other peers in the Northern Virginia, you know, broader Northern Virginia, DC, Maryland area, we by far were processing the most applications um, on a quarterly basis. So, yeah, I mean, this has been a, a super successful program and every year the state calculates kind of what our outcomes are. And so I think the number um, from a couple of years ago was um, we're reducing like 69,000 vehicle miles traveled a day just because of the number of people that were getting to share a ride. Um, versus driving alone. So it's had a tremendous, it's been tremendously successful um, and is really important for reducing congestion, improving air quality, um, and, you know, also improving people's quality of life. So, you know, you, if you're in a van pool, you can sleep, you can, you know, watch a movie, you can, you know, do work or do other things um, versus sitting in a traffic jam. Um, so, you know, we're really proud of this program and the impact that it's had on the community. That's what I was thinking. And when you talk to, you know, our citizens and you know, they talk about traffic, 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 and then to have that perspective that we are doing other things other than just putting down more pavement, that it's done, has a significant impact uh, along with the mass transportation. 
uh, in this arena. So thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions pop up from anybody? All right, then uh, we'll move on to uh, what we were briefed on last meeting was the uh, community engagement and equity plan. And there's an action item attached to this. Yeah, so uh, no presentation tonight, but I'm happy to take questions. Um, you all had uh, information shared on this at your last two meetings. So time to review the document and we had a public comment period um, on this document. So for those who might've missed the last two meetings, what this is, is this is a new Title VI and public participation plan for FAMPO rolled into one called the Community Engagement and Equity Plan. Um, we are going to be asking the policy committee to approve and adopt this plan um, next week, right? The meeting next week, yes. Um, and this is a, a staff resource primarily. Um, it's also a way to be transparent to the public about um, how we reach out to the public and how we make sure that participation is equitable um, for all members of our community. Um, but primarily it's a staff, a staff plan that we follow to help us um, stay on track and make sure we're, we're doing all the things that we need to be doing and um, you know, doing great community outreach. So if anyone has re reviewed this and you have any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I would ask the chair to open it to a vote to endorse this. By endorsing, um, we are just going to use that to tell the policy committee before they formally vote to adopt it that it has CTAC member support. Um, BPAC, the Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Committee for FAMPO, um, recently endorsed the plan, and our technical advisory committee also recently endorsed the plan. This is Rupert. I think the plan looks great, but I noticed a couple of typos you might want to take care of. Okay, yes, and um, they're actually in the policy committee packet. There is an updated version that did fix <laughs> several typos. So if you want to send me an email with the page numbers on those, I can make sure that those are the ones that, that we fix. But thank you for that. Okay. Uh, Stacy, can you just scroll down to, I think it's the first or second page. It's kind of introductory. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Go, go up, go up, go up. Uh, go higher. Is there one more above that? Is that the title? Yeah, that's the main okay. page. Uh, go down one page, please. Uh, no, okay. It, it's so it's, it's it's the very first page of of uh, type. So right after the cover page, if you go up. Okay, so um, <laughs> Fampo will gather the first sentence I think there. So if you read that first sentence about yeah, there you go. I mean, that's that's like CTAC's mission statement. If you look at that, I mean, we're supposed to be doing that, gathering and using input from the community members, other stack, other stakeholders. Maybe not so much some of the other stakeholders, but so um, and then lower barriers to participation, transportation decision making process. So I, I thought that was a pretty pretty uh, significant paragraph right there. Um, basic but, but significant and that was actually we didn't receive any public comments during the public comment period for this document but it was written um, with the help of focus group members who were made up of um, some residents people who work for agencies that work with underserved and underrepresented populations we had over 20 people in that focus group um, so really all these things and policies and the vision statement there, um, they were all, um, you know, the result of working with with those uh, focus group members as well. Yep. Uh, I've got 
a comment on uh, page 56, 57. It's under st stakeholders. It's kind of those other stakeholders position. I said, who gets on that list? Why are these people on it? If you're not on that list, what does that mean? So it's uh, go down a little bit more. Community partners. I mean, you know, salons and barber shops. I mean, what what is that really? Right. So Ruritan is a is a one of the typos that that might have been addressed there. A third one. Down. Yeah, there were a lot of typos in this one. Um, so what this list is, is we use this as a resource and it's, it's explained in the document under our outreach strategy section. Uh, it refers to this list. Um, so what it is, is these are community groups and businesses and organizations that we can reach out to for public um, involvement opportunities, such as um, Chamber of Commerce, if we want to do, you know, speak to them about our upcoming long range transportation plan. So staff has a resource to go to. Um, right now we're conducting a survey, which Ian will talk about a little later. And so we use this list, gather email addresses from them, and we have people to reach out to, to make sure that we're making all sectors of the community aware of what we're doing, but also to, to use these people to help us spread the word. Um, you see Red Dragon and Katora and Spencer Devin and Agora on there, all downtown either breweries or cafes. They actually are helping us right now, and they have in the past putting up our flyers. So that's what this list is all about. And during the public comment time, we ask people to uh, help us grow this list. We want it to be 50 pages long, if possible, because we want to have a lot of partners that we know we can go to when we have to have a conversation or share some news. Does that make sense? That, that does. Thank you. Yes. And I've actually, we've changed the title um, on the policies version to instead of stakeholders, it says community partners and stakeholders to clarify that. Okay. Uh, anyone else have questions, comments? Okay, well, we're gonna then we're gonna move to uh, an action item to endorse this plan as written. Um, some of you may want to abstain if you have not uh, read the plan. You probably would be it'd probably be difficult to endorse it if you haven't actually read it. Um, and that's that's fair and legitimate. You know, you haven't had an opportunity to do it, so you, you don't want to raise your hand and say I, I endorse this and I haven't even read it. So. Um, so uh, is there a, a motion to endorse the Community Engagement Equity Plan as written? So moved, so Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Al. Is there a second? I believe I can second, right? Can I second? I think I can. I think there were actually two people who yeah, yeah. moved the motion simultaneously. So if we can just... Mr. Chair, okay. clarify the names so that our minute taker gets in the right. That would be great. Thanks, Ian. So uh, Al was it was a, me and Rupert. And Rupert. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of endorsing the Community Engagement and Equity Plan uh, as written uh, for presentation then to the uh, Policy Committee. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, is there anyone uh, opposed? Is there anyone who would like to abstain? We can list you that, and you don't. If you you don't have to abstain, you just you just not vote. Okay. Then the uh, endorsement uh, is approved uh, to go forward along with the tax to the policy committee. Thank you. A lot of good work in that. Uh... All right. Um, Matt has a presentation on uh, an update on the Transit Feasibility Study at King George. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I'll let Jordan pull this up here. Um, so if you were at the last meeting, you saw a similar presentation just on the King George Transit Feasibility Study. Um, this is a part of our was a part of our FY21 rural work plan and is a continuous study as a part of our FY22 rural work plan. 
for the George Washington Regional Commission. Um, so I just wanted to provide another update to everyone and give anybody else um, who was in the last meeting or, or others uh, a chance to provide any comments, questions anybody may have about the study um, or, or related to top topics. Um, so really this specific study um, is a transit study to attain the feasibility of transit service, transit service in King George County. So um, there was a previous King George transit study that was done back in 2018 um, with a consultant um, and they analyzed major transit generators and the need for service among residents and commuters and provided several service scenarios. So um, that's one of the topics that we're covering is, is uh, what that study said and we're kind of providing an update to that study. Um, and we're looking at the feasibility of service in the future. So looking at transit needs, um, where transit dependent individuals are, those who, who have a higher likelihood of relying on transit to get around, get around the county. Um, a commuter analysis, so employment clusters in the county and travel patterns to Dahlgren. So where are the commuters going to and from? Where do people work uh, in general? And where, do, where are residents going to and from to get to work? Uh, as well as looking at future growth. So what type of growth may occur in the county in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Um, next slide. So of course, one of the things we looked at was a commuter analysis. Um, uh, the NSF Dahlgren, Naval Support Facility Dahlgren, is one of the largest uh, employers in the county. Um, and from the 2018 study, basically they said 60% commute between 7 to 8 a.m. So 60% of people who work at Dahlgren get there between 7 and 8 a.m. Um, and leave, uh, go home between 5 and 6 p.m. Um, so we can see some of those travel flows outlined on the map on the left there, the, the green and, and orange and the red signifying more travel flows. So the darker oranges and red signifying where more people are going to from, from Dahlgren. Um, and then the map on the right is signifying um, from them where their workers live. Um, so you can see a majority of them, or that's not all the workers, but a lot of them work in King George County and you have uh, some higher amounts in, in Spotsylvania, Stafford in the city and some in Caroline County as well. Next slide. Um, and I, I think this is a pretty cool chart that helps to illustrate um, just kind of overall uh, transportation activity in the county and, and helps to verify what times of the day you might want to provide a transit service to give the people the opportunity to, to switch their main mode of transportation. Um, so what we're looking at here is uh, from streetlight data, uh, a zone activity analysis that basically outlines um, what times of the day uh, has the most activity in the county. Um, so the, the top part of the chart, uh, the blue being weekday, uh, signifying uh, as, as similar as discussed with the Dahlgren uh, example, uh, a lot of people are getting to work between 7 and 8 a.m. You see a nice bump there. Um, and a lot of people are going home between, between 5 and 6 p.m. The, the peak hour during the weekday period in the county is between 4.30 and 5.30 p.m. So that's when the most people are traveling within the county. Um, and, and a little differently on the weekend, there's, there's different travel times. Um, you know, we don't see the commuting hours, of course. We see a, a, a different pattern here, more so a, a plateau um, around lunchtime, around 12 noon. Uh, that's our peak hour from 12 to 1. And then you just see a plateau into the afternoon um, and continues to go back down during the evening. Um, so this chart provides uh, useful knowledge and understanding what times might be good for good for transit service. And, and really, in in general, um, if you're if you're just looking at information on the county, this chart is is quite helpful in in understanding travel within the county in, in a general sense. Next slide. Uh, so really, the next steps uh, we're finalizing the study draft. Uh, there'll be a presentation uh, just on the study in general, an update to the Georgia Washington Regional Commission Board in a couple weeks. Um, as well as the King George County Board um, a few weeks after that, and then uh, later this summer as well. Um, so if you're interested in this study, uh, look for those presentations in the future. Um, and yeah, I'll happy to take any questions anyone may have. Um, if not, thank you. Yeah, Al, go ahead. The, um, so, so and this may be too early to, to even ask this question because I realize, you know, you're just, there's a preliminary study, but so if the, if they do get buses that go from say Spotsylvania or Spotsylvania Fredericksburg area, 
out to Dahlgren in the morning to carry people who are going to work. What then happens to those buses? Do they just stay out there until the five o'clock hour or? Uh, that is a great question. And I, I would not have a, a definitive answer on kind of what would happen um, with the buses. That would be a question for, for down the road. If that's uh, a recommendation scenario, <clears throat> that's a recommendation scenario the county would like to go with, then um, that something would be discussions between the county um, and Fred in, in figuring out all those kind of little details. I, I, the reason the, the reason I brought it up was, um, yeah, what came to my mind is sort of at that hour, there may be people, students right. from um, King George who are commuting into, say, Germana. And, you know, that may be a, just a good time to tie in. Now, I, I don't know, we, you know, you may want to, when it comes to that point, talk to somebody at Germana and see what the, the traffic there yeah. is. And one of one of the opportunities will be to even if you know there's there's certainly opportunity for just a commuter route that provides service only during a couple a few hours in the morning and a few hours in the evening um, there's the opportunity for more generalized route that provides service all day um, and with with either of those routes there's the opportunity to connect back into the greater Fredericksburg network of Fred transit so you provide service within the county that connects to say Fred Central and then people like Germana students who are living in, in King George County would be able to connect at Fred Central uh, down to um, down to other routes that lead to, to lead to Germana. So there's certainly uh, several opportunities for for further networks uh, network connections between the county and the Greater Fredericksburg area. Al, it's probably this is Ian. It's probably unlikely that the buses would go one way and park out there um, for all the reasons you've just mentioned. Um, so there'd be either an all day service, in which case the bus would just go every hour or every two hours, depending on what King George County and Fred Transit decide is appropriate. Or alternatively, even if it's a commuter system for the morning and the evening, you would have you know, one or two buses go out in the morning and come back bringing people into the city. And then in the evening, the same thing, go out taking people home and then bringing people who live in Fredericksburg, say, or, or Spotsylvania back into, so it would probably be there and back, there and back, there and back, then a break during the middle of the day if it's only a commuter service, and then the same in the evening. It's unlikely you'll park a bus there doing nothing for the for the whole day. I would think, but thanks. Hey, uh, Al, Dave Swan, uh, historically, that same question was posed with operators of uh, commuter buses uh, going north to Washington, D.C., uh, back when uh, there were lots of uh, companies providing commuter bus service north. And the, the dilemma was, what, what are you going to do with the bus once you've made your trips, um, you know, in the morning? And I don't know the answers to that. Uh, it was a very difficult question. And I think some of the bus operators found other uh, things they could do, as um, uh, Mr. Hollis said, to bring uh, passengers the other way back down south, which in those days uh, was not as advantageous as it is today, I would think because there are more workers up there now who are shift workers and all, and uh, it might work better today. So I don't know about shift workers in the Dahlgren area. I, I don't think there are. I think uh, the peak periods that are shown in the presentation are uh, d probably don't include shift workers. So, but just to comment, that was a, a big question and a big dilemma. Uh, back when I was just, I was not on FAMPO, I was meeting in with county officials and uh, bus companies and everybody else talking about transportation and how to solve the north-south problem. So I thought I'd add that. It's a great question.
All right, well, if that's all the questions we had, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if your mic is muted. Uh, Dave, we can't hear you. I think just click. I thought for a minute they were going to try to solve Al's question. Maybe that's what they're comparing uh, on. I, <laughs> Matt, I think, Matthew, I think he wants you to yeah. just keep going. Yep. Yeah, I'm happy to just keep going, uh, move on to the next slide since I do have the next presentation. Uh, so this is Smart Scale Round 5, uh, providing just a little bit of an update on where we are at with the next round of Smart Scale. Um, so as you know from the previous rounds, some of you who are on the committees, uh, FAMPO and GWRC, so each of each organization has a total of four applications that we can submit for smart scale um, and FAMPO primarily works on submitting those applications. Um, so for round five, next slide. Uh, we have developed a preliminary timeline um, for how the process is going to go over the next uh, kind of eight, 12 months uh, into next year when we get into the actual submissions for pre-applications and final applications for Smart Scale. Um, so we've kind of began initial discussions and the starting development of a preliminary list of projects from our regional partners, uh, the localities, uh, for applications. So we're looking to create a preliminary list uh, in the next month or so um, and have that for review and then presentation of the August um, at the August uh, TAC meeting. Um, so reviewing that list and then selecting initial uh, selection of projects. Um, so really what we're looking to do is, is start this process, as some of you may have noticed uh, earlier than last time. Uh, we're trying to give time, uh, one of the reasons for, for VDOT to provide as much assistance as they can earlier on in the process in developing the application so we don't have so much of a crunch time near the end in getting things done. And then also, um, just kind of the ease of, of the ability to, to have things finished ahead of time so that always go into the pre-application process and the final submission process we have everything figured out and it's it's a much easier much much smoother process uh, so we're, we're beginning that now um, this summer um, and you can see the the timeline on the screen outlining uh, what we're looking to do over the, the summer months and then into the fall as we get up into march when pre-application submissions begin um, and and from there in in march of 2022 we have pre-applications and then further down the road in June and July, we have the submission period for the final applications. Um, and then once those are submitted, we start the process of the, the scoring of the applications um, and then the announcement of project scores within the next uh, year after that. So um, next slide. So as I mentioned, we're collecting applications from our localities. Uh, VDOT has provided them a list of potential projects that meet VTrans priority one needs. Um, and these can help localities identify potential areas of focus. Um, and staff are available to help localities identify potential projects. Um, and there are several other resources that uh, they can and maybe will use to identify projects, including FAMPO's LITP, previous smart scale projects that did not receive funding, CMAC RSTP projects and local comprehensive and transportation plans. Next slide. So we've requested that localities and eligible applicants submit a list of projects to FAMPO and GDBC for consideration by July 16th. Um, that'll give us a few weeks to review the applications and put together uh, the list of all the projects for the uh, August TAC meeting. Um, so once those projects are received by staff, uh, that's what we'll do for the August TAC meeting. Um, I believe that is the last slide in the presentation. Uh, happy to answer any questions anyone has on this. Uh, and really, any, any questions about smart scale in general, if anybody has those as well. Just to clarify, smart scale is the state's uh, funding mechanism for 
attempting to fairly allocate funding across the state to all regions uh, rather than have a politically driven process. So it's a it's, it's a yeah. method of allocating funding to projects in the transportation sphere. Right, MPOs, localities, and and PDCs and other organizations are are state organizations are eligible to submit applicants uh, four or five or, or more depending on their their population. Um, they're eligible to submit applications to the states, um, and the state reviews the hundreds of applications every other year. So it's every two years, um, and then puts together a list of prioritized projects for funding um, that goes to the CTB. And the current list of the previous round, the round four projects, are, are um, I guess being approved by CTB and uh, will be into the six-year improvement plan come uh, July 1st. So then basically we're starting the, the process for the next round now since those are uh, basically complete. Um, and I'll, I'll reference as well, if anybody's interested in any material on the round four applications or, or previous rounds that FAMPO and GWC took part in, um, there, are, there are presentations in, um, I want to say February and March of this year at the CTAC meetings, as well as the TAC meetings um, and, and policy committee meetings on some of the smart skill items, as well as we have a web page on our, on our website that can provide anyone with, with more information on that. Um, or you can also just go to the v.smartscale website uh, for more information as well. Uh, the chairman is indicating, I think he wants us to carry on. Well, Ian, I think it's your turn. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's fallen to me to do a presentation on the um, transportation improvement survey that we are currently running as FAMPO. Um, the link is over there, but it's also in your packet on the agenda. You can click on the link. Um, and we really want to just give you a very brief four slides just talking about where we are with the survey if you can scroll up so the aims of the survey really are to find accessibility gaps in the total transportation system in the fampo region and congestion problems from the public's point of view we could ask politicians we could ask uh, transportation experts but what does the public think Secondly, to understand commuters' transportation choices and why they choose those options. Why do they choose to use their car and not the bus or the train or um, the Omni-Ride bus, or, for example? And then look at public opinion on multi multimodal options to ease congestion and to improve accessibility. What does the public actually want? It's important to know these things when we do transportation planning, and we will use those results to inform the the LRTP update, which is coming, the 2050 update, the East-West Mobility Study, which we're about to begin in July and August, and to help our localities identify future project ideas that they could work on to improve transportation. Next slide. So the survey is a total of 19 questions to complete uh, per person. The first four are common questions. Everybody fills them in, they're the demographic type questions and what area you live in and so on. And then questions five to 19 are tailored to three different groups of people. So if you say before COVID you were teleworking from home, there are a set of questions tailored to you. If you say that you work uh, locally in Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania or Stafford, there's a slightly different set of questions tailored to you. And if you work elsewhere, say in Washington, D.C. or Northern Virginia or Richmond, then there's a separate set of questions uh, for you to answer as well. So effectively, there's, there are around 49 unique questions in this survey, which is a huge number. And we really thought when we started this that we might have difficulty getting lots of people to take the survey. But we did some marketing um, and some footwork, groundwork. Stacy did some tables at... Um, farmers markets and we went to the Fred Transit Center, we sent out emails and, and all that. And actually it's been more successful than we anticipated, I think. Uh, if you could scroll down to the next slide. So when I put the slide deck together and sent it out to everybody, um, we had 
700 people had taken the survey. Well, I can tell you, I just checked on, on the um, software uh, a minute ago, and we now have 927 people who've taken the, software, the, the survey. This represents the largest number of people who've taken a FAMPO survey that we can find in living memory. Normally we get 180, 200, 220. We have 927 so far have taken the survey. There's a lot of interest in the survey um, and our marketing has worked and congratulations to Stacey for, for doing a lot of marketing on this. Um, there's a balance between male and female and some gender neutral people. There's a good spread of general home locations throughout our jurisdictions and a very wide spread of work locations. One person actually indicated that they work um, in Delaware, in, in central Delaware. And if you think of that person trying to get to work from, say, Fredericksburg, that is a long commute. So people are working all over. Um, there is the survey. Uh, that's just a, a, a rough um, overview of it. Um, it's proving fantastically successful. Um, we're in our list got um, uh, links and whatever. And Stacy's going to talk into a minute, to talk to you in a minute about um, taking the survey or asking others. Uh, the only looking through the the respondents, um, the only category where we may be could really do with some more people taking the survey is is uh, demographics that represent um, minority groups or low income people. If you know any um, lower income folks or people that are from minority communities, please encourage them to take the survey. But I'll leave it to Stacy to to talk about that. She's she's the expert on that. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, so we wanted to issue a challenge to CPAC members um, to help us get over a thousand survey responses. Um, so we're asking each CTAC member if you'll commit to telling three people who qualify to take the survey, so those that live in the FAMPO area and either travel regularly or did before COVID, so in 2019 or current, um, regularly traveled either to work, to college, or to a volunteer job. Um, encourage them to take the survey. Take the survey yourself too, if it applies to you. Um, and you can also share it on social media. Tomorrow I'll be sending out an email that gives you a little graphic and a little blurb that you can share on social media. Or if it's easier for you to go to the FAMPO's Facebook page or Twitter page and just share our, um, our, our pinned post, you'll see on our Facebook page, Page specifically, we have a little pinned video post that you can share that. Um, but we're challenging you to help us spread the word on this. I know many of you actually have. So if you know um, large employers, uh, I know um, Al and John had helped us pass the word to Germana. So that was really great. Um, so you don't have to do three. Um, we really, really would appreciate you can do three, but I'm saying you can also do more. So that would be great if you have large contact database that you can help us share that with. Um, so if we complete the challenge, and it's going to be honor system here, um, but we can tell, we can tell, you know, as Ian said, that the survey data is going up. So we're going to know if you're helping us or not in, in a roundabout way. Um, we will do a luau themed CTAC meeting for our next CTAC meeting if we can get way over that 1,000 mark. So luau kind of food, you can wear your Hawaiian shirts, lays, grass skirts, what have you. It'll be fun. This is Rupert. I'd be inclined to do the reverse. When I took a look at the survey to review it, I thought this is a real, a real insult to anyone's time to uh, be asked to stop what they're doing and, and answer four questions. I could hardly uh, discern anything important in the way of transportation planning, because that's all you see is four questions and submit. Um, Rupert, I think, and we'll have Matthew run through, depending on how you answer the questions, it takes you along a certain track. I, I um, didn't, so I didn't, I didn't answer the questions. I was reviewing the survey. I wasn't taking the survey. Yeah, okay, that so, might be it. Go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, I guess just a quick explanation. I think as um, Jordan, if you wanted to stay on this question quickly, so 
I think as Rupa is mentioning, you see kind of four questions at first. Um, as Ian had mentioned, kind of the purpose of the survey, we're looking to analyze where people are working. Um, and that's kind of our, our general, what we're looking at. So this is kind of the question where it splits up into what Ian was mentioning. There's 19 questions under each of these questions here. So under telework, under Fredericksburg and under elsewhere, there's 19 or uh, 15 other questions. And this is where we get into the uh, total of 49 some questions. So of course, yes, you do see only four questions when you start, um, but, but for the purposes of the survey, when we split it up into where people work, then you get a sense of what uh, all the other questions are. So my, I, my point, my point is there's nothing in there to indicate there's more than those four questions. And um, just to glance it over, I would, you know, if that were a piece of paper instead of a, a you know, a computer uh, survey, I'd throw it in the trash. Yeah, well, I, I would, yeah, I'll say I'll just, I'll encourage you to, if, if you want, to go take a look at the survey again and, and of course, take the survey in, in general as, as all CTAC members. If you guys want to, take the survey, give us some responses and uh, add to our add to our, our numbers. Hopefully, we can reach 1,000. Well, we're going to add, can, can you scroll back up, Matthew, to the um, map mapping page? So, we realize it's kind of a clunky format. Um, and like Rupert pointed out, when you skim it, you see those four questions and somehow like with the map, I myself, a lot of people have not because we've had over 900 responses. So they're not having difficulty, but I, I kind of struggled with how I was supposed to use the map. Um, but we did what over a month of research trying to find a survey application that would allow us to do this specific um, mapping because we want to be able to sort our data uh, more at the micro level and to our knowledge no MPO has ever done this before um, and we think we found you know a solution here but the trade-off is it's kind of clunky um, it's not that great to interact with but for our purposes um, it's it's better for us because we can have that really finite level of analysis and that's really what we're looking for here well fortunately for you I suspect most people, when they get a survey, they just launch into it and start answering questions. Me, I flip through the survey and review it before I answer the first question, because if it looks like a stupid survey, I'm not going to waste my time. And for folks like me, this looks like something that's not worth worth wasting my time on. Hey, Matthew, uh, uh, this is Dave Swan. Uh, I just took the survey tonight before the meeting. And I didn't have any problem. Uh, I answered the 19 questions. I went through it. I didn't realize there were four to start with because as I answered the questions, I guess it opened up the, the remainder. Right. The only issue that I saw, and uh, again, I don't think you can fix this, is the map. And as Stacy said, it's clunky. Uh, but I figured it out. Of course, I've lived here uh, almost 35 years now. So um, I know I had a little trouble finding out where I lived, just to be honest with you, right. but but I figured it out, and then it's not real clear what I'm supposed to do once I uh, I know where I live, but I, I think I hit the home thing twice, and then somebody's, uh, bless you, whoever that was, but anyway, uh, I w it was able to, to indicate that I worked up at Quantico, and I think I completed it correctly. But if I have answered two of the home questions, then I haven't. But it doesn't matter because the rest of it was fine. And I think it's a good survey. Um, I don't think there's a 100% solution to any of this. But uh, I thought it was pretty good. And I think it's going to give you some good feedback. And we'll get you over 1,000. Yeah, well, well, thank you for taking it. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we do get do good over a thousand. And I can I can tell you from looking at the results so far, we have gotten some really good yep. and actually really interesting feedback on a lot of the questions. And uh, we'll have some really interesting results to share in in the coming months. Um, have on, you on have you thought about? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but have you thought about? You know, I've done a lot of standing in commuter lots over the years. I don't anymore. I just drive up to Quantico, but. Uh, in standing in commuter lots, if you had a small slip of paper that gave the link to this survey, I'll guarantee you, you'll be over a thousand in a day because commuters uh, respond. 
to com commuter related issues. And I used to stand in line with 300 people at the at the Bradford and uh, commuter lot. So just a suggestion to you. Maybe a poster with a QR code would be even better. Yeah, um, I'll I'll say we. Would work. Yeah, we have we have printed several posters and, and a lot of flyers that um, Stacy has used for a lot of her public involvement. Um, she's been to several mm -hmm. events over the past uh, few weeks, um, and, and I've gotten some people to take the survey with with some of the posters we've printed and, and just uh, done a really good job with the outreach efforts so far. So uh, one, of the, yeah. one of the key benefits of the survey is that we're going to be able to link uh, your approximate home location with your concerns so if you say in that long form answer it's difficult to access stafford from where i live we can then draw a line from the approximate area where you live to stafford and see where the problems are in the transportation system in the roadways in the bridges etc if you say you have difficulty with a bus because you live in y place we can look at the bus network where you live and see why it's difficult for you to access it so the location system which is was the difficult part of of getting into the software um, really helps because it tells us where the problem is and you'll see when we publish the results that all sorts of interesting things have come to light about where people are experiencing transportation problems either in their car or on the bus or getting access to the train or Omni ride, Fred, et cetera. And, and there are some really interesting comments from a lot of people, which I think will help us enormously. When, when is the deadline for the survey? Uh, so we're gonna run it until next Friday, which is that the 20, 25th, 24th, 25th? Yep, it'll close on Friday the 25th. Friday the 25th, we're going to close the survey. So we've got just over a week, a week and a couple of days left. But it's been super successful with 927 people taking it. I mean, that's an all time record for FAMPO. So we're really, really thankful for the community buying in and helping us and filling in all 19 questions. It's a long survey and we, we're really super excited to see the results. And, and for anyone here who's interested in, in taking it, of course, the link is on the screen, but I also pasted it in the, the meeting track chat as well, so you can just click through that. Thank you very I, much. I will, this is Dave Swan again. I will, I will attempt to uh, see if I can get the Training and Education Command at Quantico, which is a, a very large organization to put out some information on this. I see no uh, prohibition against doing that. We're all, all of us who work at Quantico, uh, active duty contractor, uh, civilian employees up there are concerned about commuting and face different issues from all the areas we come from. So I think the commands up there would really like to publicize this. I, I, will, I will encourage the ones that I know to do that. Thanks very much. You're welcome. All right, with no further questions, I think uh, back to the chairman and we'll move on the agenda. Can, can you hear me? I've dialed in. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I don't know what happened with my uh, linkage uh, on my computer, but anyway, so I'll, I'll be on the phone. Uh, we're going to move to the um, uh, election. Um, we know that there are no, uh, the, the next uh, municipality to take over uh, the, the chairmanship would be um, Spotsylvania County. There was no one in Spotsylvania County currently who uh, is able to do that. So then it would rotate then to Stafford. So we're asking if Stafford, any of the members or any of you in Stafford know uh, anyone who is willing to be elected to be the chairman for the coming year? And maybe Dave can help us on this. Yeah, I really wish I could. Unfortunately, uh, I've had some uh, family issues in the last uh, 
three weeks, uh, you know, since we had our, our last meeting. And uh, I wasn't able to uh, get out to my contacts. But I think Milt Staten, I haven't heard from him recently, and I don't have his number. Uh, from my view, he should be the one. But, um, you know, I'm not the one who makes the decision. And okay. I can tell you that there's a, there's a lot going on in Stafford government uh, at the present, and so I don't know if I can even get a hold of my own supervisor. Um, the best thing to do is to talk to the chairman of the Stafford County Board, and I don't know who that is at the moment, but I'll, I'll find out. Um, it's okay. Me, it's, we're trying. Well, I guess what we're trying to establish right now, is there anyone that we know of in Stafford uh, right now who is online or has indicated in any way that they're interested? Is there anybody online or dialed in this meeting from Stafford who wants to be considered and elected to be the chairman of the committee? Dave, okay. the only other person from Stafford we have is Wade Sudreth. Um, the other okay. members from Stafford are absent. Okay, uh, so it looks Glenn like we Goldsmith. have a Glenn Goldsmith is here, um, but I I'm, I am unable to partake in that at this time. Okay. Uh, let's, okay, we got a little loophole here uh, in our bylaws. We are ele the election is called for in June or the next scheduled meeting. So what we can do is we can uh, delay this, which will be two months because we do not have a meeting scheduled for next month to August, and at that time, we may actually get some more people appointed, first of all, from Spotsylvania County, which is the county that we hopefully would be taking over as a chair, as the normal rotation uh, called for in the bylaws. Um, and uh, if not, then maybe we could uh, also get a, a volunteer uh, from Stafford, uh, at least to be the vice if, uh, if Spotsylvania becomes the chair. So. Um, is there any discussion on a kind of a, a proposal to use the bylaws to just kick this down the road uh, another two months? Uh, Dave, Dave Swan, I'll make a motion that we do just as you said. That I don't think we even need to vote on it because it is an option that's in the in the, uh, the bylaws. But uh, uh, is the staff got any input on that proposal? Okay. Uh, all right, then uh, Dave has uh, made a motion that we uh, kick the election down to the next scheduled meeting, which will be in August. Is there a second for that that motion? Sure, we're all seconded. This is Rupert. Thank you, Thank you Rupert. Uh, is every is uh, all in favor of delaying the election uh, till August? Indicate aye. 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 Is, is there anybody opposed other than me? <laughs> All opposed, me. <laughs> All right. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could just okay. say that it's, um, you know, we're quite happy to, to have the election delayed until your meeting in August, but I would urge every member here to please make an effort to invite a new person to attend CTAC and become a member of CTAC and also to spread the word that we are looking for representatives as the chairman just indicated which jurisdictions etc so that we find a chairman so that in August we don't um, face a crisis uh, we'd like to you know between now and then discuss among yourselves talk to friends find out who's available so that we come with a couple of names when we get to the August meeting and can do it promptly Correct. Uh, also, Ian, can, when it comes time for staff reports uh, presentation during the PC, could you address this issue that we're having with the as a limited number of representatives, especially in Pennsylvania County? I'll, I'll certainly raise it. I'm sure Stacy will be in the policy committee meeting as well, so she'll remind me or she'll make it or whatever. Thank you. You're going to be helpful. All right, so uh, you get to put up with me one more meeting. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, public comment. Now we have a period, a second period for uh, 
public comment if anybody joins us and wants to make it up uh, from the public wants to make a comment at this time. Is there anyone who's dialed in and wants to do that? Okay, is there anyone who's dialed into this meeting would li now like to make a public comment? Okay, hearing none, um, I'll close the second public comment period and we'll move to uh, correspondence. Uh, no correspondence. Okay, uh, staff reports. Yep, just a couple quick items. Um, one, I uh, just want to say thanks to Al Durante, our vice chair. Um, I believe this is your last CTAC meeting, Al, if I'm correct. So a um, lot of thanks to you. You've helped us push our survey recently. Um, you've come to in-person tabling events uh, several times and sat with me and helped me talk to members of the public. Um, you've kept us updated on upcoming legislation in the General Assembly that would have flown past our radar. So um, you definitely were a valuable member of CTAC and we're going to miss you. Um, wish you well in your new endeavors. Um, also wanted to highlight um, at the last meeting, uh, someone asked, I think it was Dave Schwan, um, about having a CTB representative come and talk about um, what's on the state's radar about any uh, expected federal fund funding package for transportation coming through. Um, our CTB representative for the Fredericksburg area is Cedric Rucker, and he is out of the country. So once he gets back, I'm gonna try to work with him and see if he can come and attend and present some information if there's anything there. Um, member spots was on my list. Encourage you guys to um, spread the word. We have open seats. We are doing that on social media and have notified locality um, board of supervisors, clerks and city council clerks about the need to fill these seats. Um, also wanted to let you know that on Saturday, um, we'll be at the Fredericksburg Downtown Farmers Market from nine in the morning until uh, one. So if you feel like coming out and doing some shopping, make sure you stop by our table. We'll be giving out free water with QR codes, um, trying to get more survey answers is the purpose there. Um, also staff attended a FRED um, workshop and they talked about upcoming work to rebrand FRED. So new look for the buses, uh, new color logo, new marketing scheme, um, just revamping. That's in the very, very early stages, but I thought that might be of interest. And so watch for something there. Um, they Once they settle on some general ideas, they are gonna do public outreach and ask the public what they think of the proposed changes. Um, also, um, Matthew, our planner that you heard pre present, present tonight, um, he is going to be developing a map that I think will be really helpful. Um, it'll allow CTAC members and then eventually members of the public to place a pin on areas in the FAMPO region. Um, and you can leave comments saying, you know, this intersection needs an improvement. Here's a suggestion on how it needs to be improved or this area is really dangerous for pedestrians. Um, VDOT has something similar that reports um, directly to them and they actually go out and fix those sorts of problems. But it's just a easier way, an interactive way of us to um, bring you guys into the planning process and also the public as well. So look forward to that. Um, and at the next meeting, um, our other transportation planner, Carrie Barber, has um, been doing a great deal of work on our trail system. Um, she's had several big group meetings where they've discussed a regional trail network plan. So at our August meeting, um, she'll probably attend this and give us a presentation on what her group has been working on. And let me see, uh, that's all. So I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Mr. Chair. I hope we haven't lost them again. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me, thank you. Let me add. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get this Sorry, Dave. Um, I'd really like to, to uh, add an additional endorsement to what, what was said about Al before, because as the vice uh, behind the scenes, uh, we had many discussions and emails going back and forth talking about uh, how we can do things better or uh, proposals and and uh, and ideas and and. Uh, uh, and he was very helpful and very active as advice. So I thank Al. I personally thank Al for that service. 
Um, I'd like to, uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, well, one thing for the next meeting uh, at the, uh, at the, uh, TAC meeting, uh, Ian presented an FY21 year in review and way forward, which was very helpful. I thought it was very interesting. And so if we teed that up in, in uh, August, that would be great, I think, to kind of wrap up the year and kick off into the new fiscal year for us. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind. Ian. Thank you. Okay, um, are there uh, any of the uh, members of the board that w or the committee that want to speak or present the updates from their locality? Uh, Dave, Dave Swan, uh, you know, you've heard me say this before, but right now the state has a uh, surplus in the coffers in excess of a billion dollars. And they're in a dilemma as to how to spend that money and a lot of voices are raised up in saying key for transportation i don't think we're going to see a billion we need a couple billion to be honest we know that from previous uh, work but we should get a good chunk and I know locally here in Stafford County and, and uh, the, the person who spoke earlier tonight about the bicycle uh, lanes and, and paths, uh, we really need shoulders on our roads. And I know Spotsy is the same way. And it's, it's a, uh, I look at it as a public safety issue. Uh, deputies don't pull over people on country roads. And there's a reason for that. And they should, they should enforce traffic everywhere, but they're unable to do that. And they put their lives at risk. Uh, and now there's a shortage of police uh, in at least three localities that I know of. So if we can, if we can see, to, see it our way to somehow get a message to the, the CTB that Maybe it's time to think shoulders and have a shoulder plan to comply with Commonwealth, I believe, regulations for rural roads. Uh, and, and those are not just rural roads, they're major feeder roads as well. So that, that's all I have to add tonight. Thank you. Uh, is any, anybody else? Yeah, this is Al. Um, I have talked to a couple of supervisors who said they will be hopping on nominating some folks from Spotsylvania. Uh, I may try to speak to a couple more. Um, but that, that aside, I, uh, tonight is my last meeting. I will be moving to East Texas on July 5th, which is actually a national holiday observed. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to uh, uh, go ahead and uh, say how much I've enjoyed my time here on CTAC. Uh, it's been very educational, very, very fulfilling. I mean, for an advisory committee, uh, this is a very rewarding committee. And, and I do tell people that if I try to recruit them for the open spots. Um, and uh, I have great respect for every member of this community of this committee rather um you know people come here dedicated to uh really making transportation and, and quality of life as an extension of that uh a better for all regional residents and uh, i also uh really want to give my thanks to the entire staff who have done an amazing job in my view uh stacy has done Great work reaching out to the community, uh, but everybody has, you know, really, I, I feel everybody in the staff, as well as all the members, but particularly everybody in the staff has, has gone above and beyond, particularly in, in, in the last, you know, well, basically since I came on the committee, because uh, pretty much when I first came on the committee, we lost you know, a couple of key members. Um, and so that slack needed to be sort of taken up. And uh, I, I just want to thank everybody and say that uh, 
appreciate having the opportunity to spend time with you. Thank you. Move for adjournment, Mr. Chairman. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Um, I just want to have a reminder that uh, we have an opportunity. We're going to get an email or something about uh, riding through in our, in, our, in, our, in our community and uh, uh, then we also have uh, we want to share the uh, transportation improvement uh, study uh, survey should, I should say so we can get more attendance on that I just wanted to throw those in at the last minute okay so we have had a, a, a motion to adjourn the meeting is there a second Alex, your last chance. <laughs> okay, I saw you nod your head. Alex, Alex says, second is adjourning. Is, it, is everybody in favor of adjourning the movie? Mo the meeting. Right. I'm here. All right. All right. All right. All right. Anybody opposed? Okay, I'm hearing, I'm hearing myself out of two sides of my ears. And, uh, sorry about that. Echo in here. All right, uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Best of everything, Al.